All right, everybody, welcome back to the next lecture. We are going to start this one with a matching exercise, and we're going to do a matching exercise to test your knowledge of childhood and early onset disorders. So I want you to hit the pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back when you think you've got everything correct. All right, so hopefully you did well. If you need to fix anything, hit the pause button, go ahead and do so. Otherwise, let's take a look at some of the high yield childhood and early onset disorders that you're likely to see on exam day. Step one, step two, and step three. So if you take a look at your books, let's just go down the list from top to bottom. So first, let's start at the top here with ADHD. Remember, this is a condition that's characterized by a limited attention span and or poor impulse control. Now, in order to make a diagnosis here, you need to see this A, before 12 years of age, B, for six or more months, and C, in two or more settings. Now, if you look at the DSM, they're gonna go into a ton of detail about the diagnostic criteria. For the sake of our exams though, just remember those big factors, before 12, six or more months, two or more settings. Now, don't forget, children with ADHD, they have normal intelligence, but they do tend to have difficulties in their school settings because they have trouble paying attention to things. Now remember, we're going to typically uh, treat this with um, stimulants, right? Like Ritalin, Adderall, those types of medications. Then we have autism spectrum disorder. Now this is seen in early childhood, and this is characterized by deficits in social settings, as well as with communication. Patients have restricted interests, and they typically demonstrate repetitive and uh, ritualistic behaviors. Now intellectual disability is commonly seen in the autism spectrum disorder, but they also have this really unique feature, which is they tend to have an above average ability with specific skills. Oftentimes they're, they're musical geniuses. So keep that in mind. They, they can have intellectual disability, but they do also have supernatural talents and abilities in other areas. Next up, we have conduct disorder. This is the same as the antisocial personality disorder, but this is seen in someone under 18 years of age. The main features here, just like an antisocial personality, um, the patterns of repetitive, pervasive behaviors that violate social norms, and they tread on the basic rights of others. They don't care if they hurt you. They don't care if they steal from you, damage your property. It's just part of the condition. Now, think of criminal-like behavior. That's typically what you would um, put under the umbrella of conduct and antisocial personality disorder. Now, remember, you need to see conduct disorder prior to 18 years of age in order to make that diagnosis after 18 of antisocial. And we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, later in the uh, personality disorders. Now, up next is disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. Now this is seen prior to 10 years of age. This is characterized by recurring temper outbursts that are out of proportion to what you would normally think a situation merits. For example, let's say uh, you know I have a nine-year-old child and I take away, um, you know, or I take a bite out of his ice cream, let's say, and he just flips his lid, goes nuts. Shouldn't merit that sort of reaction, but it does. Now that's you know just an example. One of the key features though uh, of this condition, aside from these outbursts, is that between episodes, the child is irritable, the child is angry. And so that's something you wanna really keep an eye out for in a vignette, it's not just an isolated event, but this recurring pattern, plus just anger and irritability in between those episodes. Next, we have intellectual disability. Of course, this is characterized by just a global cognitive deficit that affects all areas of cognition. Now, do not confuse this with a specific learning disorder. The learning disorder is characterized by the inability to develop some sort of basic proficiency in a specific area of study. For example, I, you just can't do math. You just you struggle with grammar, whatever it may be. That's specific. And otherwise, aside from that specific learning disorder, intelligence is normal. I know a lot of people growing up, you know, they would have to go to special classes because they just, they were not good at math. But outside of that, you wouldn't know there's anything wrong with them because there's not. There's just a specific issue with certain topics. Okay. So very common. Just remember cognition otherwise is intact. All right, let's move on. Oppositional defiant disorder. This is next. And the main finding with this one, this one is an ongoing pattern of anger, irritability, as well as argumentativeness 
towards figures of authority. So teachers, um, policemen, parents, uncles, grandparents, whatever it may be. Um, they may also become defiant, defiant as well as vindictive against these authority figures. So that's something to keep in mind uh, as well. They're not just necessarily, you know, ignoring them, but they, they could go as far as becoming uh, vindictive. Uh, and that's just, you know, something to keep in mind if it pops up in a vignette. Now, there's another condition here known as selective mutism. This is interesting. This is classified as an anxiety disorder, and it lasts at least one month. So you need to see it for at least one month uh, in order to make a diagnosis. As well, it needs to be seen before five years of age. Now, this is characterized by selectively refraining from speaking in some circumstances, while in other more comfortable circumstances, you basically return to normal. Okay. Um, one thing to keep in mind with this is oftentimes this is associated with other anxiety disorders. So that's you know something to look out for in a vignette. Um, separation anxiety disorder is next. Now, separation anxiety is when a child has this severe fear of being separated or abandoned from their parent or their guardian or the caregiver um, that just causes su such significant distress that it's very, very troubling to see. Um, in order to make a diagnosis, you want to see this for at least four weeks. Now, this can be normal in some children, up to three to four years of age. So if you see a two-year-old who's demonstrating these, these separation anxiety signs and symptoms, I wouldn't diagnose it as that in your vignette uh, or in your, in your answers uh, because it can be normal in that age. So you want to make sure you look at age before you just jump to that diagnosis. Now, one of the additional findings that you might see in this instance is a child who constantly fakes illnesses to get out of going to school. Why? They want to stay close to their caregiver. A lot of children do this just because they do it doesn't mean that they necessarily want to be close to their parents. They just might not want to go to school. They want to stay home and play video games, watch cartoons. So just make sure you look at the whole picture and you don't just see a vignette that says, this child is constantly faking sickness. What's the diagnosis? Don't just jump to conclusions ever, especially with psych because there's so many variables that can you know really change a diagnosis. The last one here is Tourette syndrome. Now this is a condition characterized by either vocal or motor tics that will last for at least one year. So you need to see them at least for one year prior to diagnosing this condition. And you need to also see this before 18 years of age in order to make that diagnostic criteria met. So at least one year prior to 18 years of age. Okay. Now just one last thing before we move on. What are two conditions that Tourette syndrome might be linked to? And I'm going to test you on this later, so I hope you, uh, if you don't know, pay attention. They can be linked to OCD and ADHD. Don't forget that. Tourette's can be linked to a uh, uh, ADHD and OCD. That will come up again. Make sure you remember that. All right, let's move on to the next question. we got a multiple choice here. Go ahead and hit that pause button, and then come on back when you think you've got the right answer. All right, let's take a look at Korsakoff syndrome and at the different types of amnesia that we need to know. First, to address this specific question, Korsakoff syndrome is a condition we see where in what population? Alcoholics. And the signs and symptoms are a result of a vitamin B1 deficiency. And as a result of this, they develop amnesia and disorientation. Now, they are more likely to develop anterograde amnesia than they are retrograde. Now, I mentioned amnesia and disorientation, but what is the most identifiable and just wild, unique uh, feature that you see in Korsakoff syndrome? I've, I remember this from my psych rotation. It's, it's, it's a wild thing to see. It's confabulations, right? They will just fill us, fill, they, they have a story, but there's gaps in the story, and they very, very um, smoothly fill those gaps with just made up stuff. It's interesting to watch. Now, which part of the brain is most affected by Korsakoff syndrome? What do you think? Well, it's the limbic system, especially two specific areas. Do you know what they are? We have the mammillary bodies and the anterior thalamus. Don't forget that. Super important anatomy, right? It's all combined. Now, don't forget that anterior grade amnesia, which I said is more common in Korsakoff syndrome, means that there is a difficulty in forming new memories after the CNS insult. So once the alcoholic has drank so much that they've exacerbated this deficiency of vitamin B1 and damaged those structures, we have a CNS insult. From here moving forward, it's going to be difficult to form new memories. 
That means that once this starts, they're going to have trouble remembering the things that are happening to them as they move forward. Now, of course, retrograde means they have trouble remembering things that happened before the insult. That can still happen here. It's just not as likely or as common as anterograde amnesia. Now, we've also got a condition known as dissociative amnesia. This is an interesting condition whereby someone has trouble remembering important personal information following a really stressful event or a traumatic event. So watch for this in conjunction with a dissociative fugue, right? That's when someone gets up, leaves their home, takes on a new uh, identity, forgets everything, and it sort of lives a second life. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later, um, but just remember um, that you know, let's say something really crazy happens, like you get into a car accident and you, you know, you, you just escape death and the ambulance people come and the cops come and they say, you know, where do you live? What's your name? And you, you just, for some reason, you're like, I, I can't remember. That would be an example of dissociative amnesia, right? You just have trouble remembering that important information because you just got put through such a stressful event. Doesn't mean you've lost your memory, it's just temporary. Now before we move on, let's look at the other two dissociative disorders so that we can round off this discussion. First, we've got a condition known as depersonalization and derealization disorder. Now this is when someone has persistent feelings of detachment or estrangement from one's own body, from their thoughts, from their actions, and from their perceptions. Now, if they feel detached from their environment, that's what we call derealization. Now, dissociative identity disorder is a very interesting disorder characterized by the presence of two or more distinct identities or personalities, right? It used to be called multiple personality disorder. Now, there's a show, I don't know if it's on HBO or Showtime or whatever, it was called United States of Terra or something along those lines. And it was, uh, this lady has multiple personalities. So if you want to see this in sort of a um, uh, cinematic way, check out that show. Um, you know, it's not scientific, but it'll give you an idea of, you know, what this could look like in, in, a, in an entertaining sort of way. Now, do not forget that this condition here that we're talking about, dissociative identity disorder, is associated with a specific form of abuse. Do you remember which type of abuse that is? It's sexual abuse, okay? This can also be associated with depression, with PTSD, with a specific personality disorder. Do you know which one? borderline personality disorder, as well as substance abuse and somatic symptom disorder. Now, one last thing I want to mention here is that this is more commonly seen in females, okay? And that should help you support this as a potential diagnosis on exam day. All right, let's move on to our next question. We have a multiple choice. Go ahead and hit that pause button and then come on back when you think you've got the right answer. All right, so the most common type of hallucination that you are likely to see in a state of delirium is the visual hallucination. Now, we'll take a look at the different types of hallucinations momentarily, but first, let's look at the important information that we need to know about delirium. First, remember that this is a reversible state of up and down levels of consciousness that starts abruptly and is most often going to happen secondary to an identifiable medical illness, like an infection, like trauma, or substance abuse or withdrawal. Now, the main characteristics that you should look for when you suspect delirium include the following. Disorganized thinking, hallucinations, which are of course most likely to be visual in nature, cognitive dysfunction, agitation, misperceptions, as well as sleep-wake cycle disturbances. Now, when is this highly likely to be seen? I remember this popping up on exams. When do you most likely see delirium? When you're dealing with a patient who's in an inpatient setting, especially if they're in the ICU or if they've been in the hospital for a prolonged period of time. Now, would we see anything interesting on EEG of someone with delirium? Well, actually we would. We would see diffuse background rhythm slowing. Now, the way we manage this is very simple. Identify the underlying problem and fix it. Pretty straightforward. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the visual hallucination is the most likely type of hallucination that you will see in a delirious patient. But we still need to know how to identify the other types of hallucinations. So let's take a look at those quickly before we move on. So auditory. Auditory hallucinations are seen, are seen more so in psychiatric illnesses than in medical illnesses. So that's something really important to keep in mind when it comes to making a diagnosis. If you see auditory, I want you to think that we might be dealing with a psychiatric illness. Whereas visual 
are more likely to be seen in medical illnesses instead of psychiatric illnesses. So very easy to keep those two straight based on that fact alone. Then we have tactile. Remember, that's the touch. Tactile hallucinations are often described as having bugs crawling on your skin. And there's two common reasons why this happens. One, um, someone is withdrawing from alcohol. They haven't had a drink in a while. Or someone who's on stimulants like speed or crack, cocaine. Um, these can cause this sensation. Now, we have olfactory, which is the, the scent, the, uh, the, the, the sensation of smelling. Now, the two most likely scenarios where you're going to see an olfactory hallucination are when there's a brain tumor or if someone has temporal lobe epilepsy. And one of the classic descriptors you might see here is someone who says they smell burning rubber. If that's the case, I want you to link that to temporal lobe epilepsy. Then we have gustatory. Gustatory hallucinations, the taste hallucinations, are actually quite rare. But if they are seen, I want you to think about epilepsy. Then we have hypnagogic and hypnopompic. These are just when you're falling asleep and waking up. So hypnagogic is a hallucination you experience when you are falling asleep. Um, this could also be associated with narcolepsy, which makes sense. They're falling asleep in the middle of the day, going right into REM. Um, but next time you're falling asleep, if you ever just jump because you feel like you were falling, that would be an example of a hypnagogic hallucination. And then hypnopompic is just an, a hallucination that would happen when you wake up. And, you know, think about if you've ever woken up and there's a, the tree from outside is, is casting a shadow on your wall and you think you see some sort of, um, you know, bear in your bedroom or something like that. That would just be some sort of hypnopompic hallucination. It's just your brain playing a trick on you because you haven't woken up yet. All right, let's move on to the next question. We're going to do another matching exercise. So I'm going to give you a few minutes. Go ahead and hit that pause button. Come on back and we will discuss the important information you need to know about schizophrenia. All right, if you guys need to pause and fix anything, go ahead and do so now. Otherwise, let's take a look at schizophrenia and the disorders that fall into the spectrum of schizophrenia disorders. Let's start with the big one, schizophrenia. This is seen more often in males than it is in females, and in males, it tends to develop much earlier. Now, this is a chronic and highly debilitating illness that is associated with altered dopaminergic activity, increased serotonergic activity, and decreased dendritic branching. Now, I don't know the specific numbers, and this is just an aside, but when I was doing psych in med school, um, my teacher had mentioned that a good majority of the people you see sleeping in the park or just living on the streets actually most likely have schizophrenia. So that's something to keep in mind just for empathetic sake. You know, when you see people outside, you know, they might not just be choosing that they just might have no one to turn to and so it's always good to just approach everybody you know with an empathetic ear and um you know recognize that maybe they are sick all right that's just an aside i only say that because you know it's something that we see a lot of in big cities so which you know i'm in a big city right now so anyway this is characterized by positive symptoms positive symptoms are things that are added on to your your person so hallucinations right delusions etc anything that's added Negative symptoms are also present. Think of negative symptoms are things that are taken away. Let's say I have a great bubbly personality, which I'm sure I don't, but let's say I did. If I all of a sudden was just sort of sitting around and just talking, you know, kind of like this, something was taken away from me. You could say that my affect became flattened. It's a classic example of a negative symptom. Another is anhedonia. I can't enjoy anything. Apathy. I don't care about anything. These are all things that are taken away from you, okay? Um, cognitive impairment is, of course, also a main feature of schizophrenia. So um, inattention, uh, memory impairment, memory deficits, as well as an inability to demonstrate any sort of executive planning. You know, if, if me and you are having a conversation and we're planning something for the future, someone with schizophrenia is going to have a hard time planning something from, you know, a higher level, like let's make plans and let's do this and that. It's just something that they struggle with. Now, in order to diagnose schizophrenia, there needs to be at least two of the following. Two, hallucinations, delusions, disorganized speech, disorganized or catatonic behavior, and or the presence of any negative symptoms. Now, on top of that criterion, we need at least one or more symptoms to include delusions, 
hallucinations, or disorganized speech. All of this needs to be present for at least six or more months, and at least one or more months have to uh, be characterized by the presence of active symptoms within that last six month time frame. Now, schizophrenia is best managed uh, with the use of atypical antipsychotics. Then we have a brief psychotic disorder. This is a disorder that will demonstrate one or more positive symptoms of schizophrenia, but it's present for less than one month. Now, if you encounter this circumstance in a vignette, don't forget the most common cause of a brief psychotic disorder is what? It's stress, stress related. Don't forget that. Oftentimes people just going through some crazy trauma or stress in their life, demonstrate some of these symptoms. You make sure you recognize A, lifestyle circumstances, and then recognize B, the time frame. You can't diagnose schizophrenia if it's only the symptoms have been there for 20 days. Next up, we have schizophreniform disorder. This is similar to schizophrenia and the brief psychotic disorder, but its diagnostic criteria include at least two or more symptoms that persist between one and six months. That's a very important time frame to keep in mind. That is basically saying, looks like schizophrenia, but the time frame, it's not long enough yet. Schizophreniform disorder. Then we have schizoaffective disorder. Schizoaffect. Schizophrenia and affect disorder. A mood disorder. Bipolar. Major depression. So what is this characterized by? Symptoms of both schizophrenia and a mood disorder. Bipolar. MDD. Remember, in order to differentiate this from a mood disorder with psychotic features, which is a mood disorder with the addition of psychotic features, the patient here should have at least two weeks of psychotic symptoms without mood disorders. So think of it this way. If it's a mood disorder with psychotic symptoms, the core problem is a mood disorder. In schizoaffective, the core problem is a psychotic disorder with mood disorder on top of it. That's why if you have a schizophrenic uh, if you have psychotic symptoms, like schizophrenic symptoms, without the mood disorder, you can make a diagnosis of schizoaffective disorder. Then we have delusional disorder. This also falls under the umbrella of schizophrenia spectrum disorders, and this would be characterized by one or more delusions lasting more than one month in the absence of a mood or a psychotic disorder. And finally, something we'll talk about a little bit later is the schizotypal disorder. This is a cluster A personality disorder, and it may involve brief psychotic episodes that are infrequent, and if they are there, they're less severe than you'd see in schizophrenia. Uh, we will talk about that in a couple lectures when we talk personality disorders, but just keep in mind that it's got schizo in the name, therefore it does have that ability to demonstrate those types of signs and symptoms. All right, let's call it quits here. So I'll see you guys on the next lecture where we will dive into um, the mood disorders. <laughs>